Hi there, I'm Karen Shook. Thanks very much, Christina, for the introduction. I am literally your Karen for this evening. Um, and um, it's uh, as lineups go, um, this is this is one I'm really proud to be hovering in the background of. So as chair, uh, I'll be here to give you a bit of incoherent praise and uh, then just admire what's going on. Um, many of you know how lucky we are to have Hillary joining us, sociologist, feminist, journalist, founding editor of Red Pepper, fellow of the Transnational Institute, co-author of a transformative book, uh, Beyond the Fragments, Feminism and the Making of Socialism with Lynn Segal and Sheila Robotham. As trios go, they don't get more important than that. Also author of A New Politics from the Left from 2018, which I hope we'll be hearing more uh, on those ideas. Labor, A Tale of Two Parties, written in 1987, but somehow still quite valid. And Reclaim the State, Experiments in Popular Democracy. Um, Hillary also makes an appearance in the book that we are talking about this evening. So the other person on the lineup, as you know, um, Owen Haverly. Um, Owen has written a new book. Now that is not unusual uh, in and of itself. He's written some of the most mind expanding and sharpest books I've read in the past decade. Um, you know, this book is gonna take us from the Boundary Estate to Grenfell, from Herbert Morrison to Ken Livingston and Hillary, um, from popularism to, well, conism, I suppose we could say. Um, I found it interesting reading this book. It's it's coming up for a year on, on an event that, that mostly this year I've said, I don't want to mention. Um, Owen says, writing this book was in many ways an attempt to write myself out of that numb horror. Uh, a book begun in what he calls the enormous sense of dread of uh, what I call 1212. I don't know if anyone else is calling it that. Um, and, and the soaking wet feet of that night and the numb horror of the next day. Um, and the book ends, um, or at least um, six weeks into a new labor leadership when the keywords were still forensic and Surrey and hadn't yet become Stalin and Keith. Um, so I imagine that most people in a similar place writing a book in this time, in this place, would be tempted to call it, this is why we can't have nice things. Um, but instead, Owen has given us a call for devolution, a look at the capital, not as the great when or the home of the metropolitan elite, but the most proletarian city in the country. Take that, Liverpool, apparently. Um, and suggests that we should turn inward and maybe build a shadow government. Uh, he's given us a look at the third center of power in London, beyond the rotten two cities. And I don't mean the CLP, they're quite good actually. Um, municipal London. So Owen's given us, well, something I didn't expect to be reading this year, something hopeful. Um, Red Metropolis, Socialism and the Government of London. Now that's a banner to hang up. Owen. Thank you, Karen. Um, so, yeah, it was it was very much an attempt at sort of writing something hopeful, and I, I'm very glad I wrote it then, because if I wrote it now, it would have a different tone, and I, I'm glad I wrote that book and not the one I would write now. Um, that, that one is a better, a better and less bitter one, I think, hope. Um, so I suppose the kind of element of it that I want to talk about tonight, um, and particularly with, 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 with Hillary, um, is the way that what it's really about is the alliance between bureaucracies and social movements. Um, so that's a kind of, you know, these are the two things that are considered sort of completely kind of opposed conventionally. The, you know, the sort of the sort of dead hand and the iron cage and then the kind of socialism from below and so forth. And there's a lot of kind of British political thought that's based on kind of assuming that these things are completely and utterly unconnected which I find kind of strange in a way, as there are a few places actually where they have been so completely comprehensively connected, where social movements and bureaucracies have interacted so frequently. Um, something which I, so I sort of think in many ways, the kind of 
attempt to kind of create this sort of absolute divide between socialism from below and socialism from above is, if anything, the consequence of a sort of elaborate act of denial. Um, and in many ways, part of the sort of general consensus, which I think both the, the kind of far left and the, and the kind of political center in Britain are sort of bent on enforcing the idea that nothing left wing has ever happened in, in, in British politics. Moreover, that the British left is best defined by its failures rather than its successes. So if there is a sort of optimistic tone in the book, I suppose it's because it is in some way a story of successes and a story of things that, that the successes were not necessarily the things that people were originally aiming at. Usually they didn't quite hit the thing that they were actually, you know, sort of, sort of most wanted, but managed to achieve within that a great deal more than I think we currently consider to be possible. So I suppose there are kind of um, three main sort of moments within this, um, which is sort of roughly speaking like the 1890s, the 1930s and the 1980s. And between the 30s and the 80s, the book ends up sort of going off and being about architecture instead of, of politics. So I think most of the interesting things in London government in that period actually were in housing and in planning rather than in, in the actual political machine itself. Um, which became quite conservative in that period. So the first, so, so the, kind of, the kind of history that it sketches out begins with the formation of the London County Council in 1889. And this is a kind of, it's not really intended to do anything particularly politically interesting. It's brought about because of the fact that London had sort of, you know, the London's legal boundaries had for a very, very long time been the city of London, despite the fact that, you know, by the middle of the 19th century, that made up maybe a tenth of the actual, the, the actual size of London. Um, this was kind of dealt with for a time by the Metropolitan Board of Works, which was an unelected system that kind of built the sewers, opened a few parks, built the embankment, but ended up kind of falling in a corruption scandal, which meant that a democratic body had to be set up to replace it. Um, but here for me, the kind of shadow social movement, as it were, that kind of hangs over this, this new body, this new county council, is um, the Great Dock Strike of 1889. So the Great Dock Strike happens in the same year as the formation of the London County Council, and I think it's very much kind of in the minds of the kind of people that, that, that brought us into being. Like most social democracy, you can probably make an argument that the whole thing is just a way of sort of stopping the revolution from happening, which it probably was. Um, pretty much every kind of reformist thing ever that's happened is probably that, but you know, um, that's how we're not eating grass, I suppose. Um, so, Lots of the kind of, you know, these are again sort of generally kind of treated as separate. The Great Dock Strike features very much in labour history as it's conventionally understood, because it is the first time that I suppose a kind of, uh, the sort of unskilled labour force of London make their presence known politically. And it helps create um, a new unionism, so-called, of transport workers, dockers, you know, railway men and so on that is, um, significantly different to the kind of craft unionism that, that precedes it. Um, so it brings a kind of mass working class politics to, to London. And the strike um, was successful. It was a, a successful strike against the, against the dock companies um, and helped lead to the formation of a kind of nationalised port of London. But what's interesting for me is that lots of its leaders, some of whom were kind of associated with the Liberal Party, some of whom were associated with the Social Democratic Federation, which was a Marxist organization of sorts, um, kind of got involved with the new county council, got themselves elected to it, um, got them, and had a major part in shaping its policy and shaping its, um, the kind of concrete building program that it, that it had. Um, and within that, I think there's a kind of um, link here, the link I kind of like, is between the uh, works department that the London County Council brings in and the building of council housing that they embark upon. So the first kind of major council estates in Britain are built by the London County Council um, to kind of estates um, 
in uh, kind of inner London, in um, Shoreditch and in Pimlico, uh, the Boundary Estate and the, and the Milbank Estate, and then two suburban estates, White Hart Lane in Tottenham, um, Tottenham Fields and Tooting. Um, and these are very much kind of designed in the arts and crafts style, and they're designed by kind of people that were associates of William Morris, people that were involved in the Social Democratic Federation, um, particularly, uh, God, what's his name? Owen Fleming is a particular kind of, he's the kind of main architect of the Boundary Estate and is very much a kind of Morrisonian, Morrisian, not Morrisonian, um, socialist. Whereas the construction of the estate itself um, was by a works department that was set up under the London County Council's control, paying union rates, and the, the LCC paid union rates for the first kind of 20 years or so of its existence when it was run by a kind of coalition of liberals and socialists, essentially. Um, so there was this idea that the way you would construct things would be different, you would take it out of the market, you wouldn't just take housing out of the market, you would take construction out of the market. So you would control both aspects. Um, and by the time it kind of lost, lost power in 1907, the, the LCC um, under the kind of so-called progressives um, had managed to kind of create a sort of proto-welfare state in London to quite a large degree. Um, quite limited in some ways, um, limited significantly to the kind of upper echelons of the working class, limited kind of to the deserving poor, um, as it was still called at the time, quite puritanical in some respects, but in many ways kind of much more radical than a lot of what we would expect from the time, um, particularly um, surprisingly strongly anti-imperialist, um, particularly in, in, in Battersea, um, where that kind of progressive socialist movement ends up electing um, both the first black mayor of a London borough, John Archer, and then electing the first communist MP, Shabirchi Saklavala. So there's that thing. And then there's a sort of second thing that happens quite a while later, involving some of the same sort of people, but not all, which is, I guess, a kind of conflict between two distinct visions of what, of what a socialist London government would be, between um, George Lansbury and the Poplar councillors, who again are kind of very, very important in the history of the left. This is a social movement we know a lot about. You know, that, 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 that Poplar, you know, there's the wonderful mural, there's the, the mini Lansbury clock um, commemorating the um, uh, communist, I think it's worth noting, um, councillor who um, died in prison um, as a result of the, the, the Poplar rebellion. So Poplar, you know, kind of um, refuses to set uh, a legal rate. There's a very long story behind this about the way that all the boroughs had to pay the same amount into the LCC's pot whether they were Poplar or Kensington. And they break the law, basically, they, they, you know, the slogan, best to break the law, break the poor, kind of comes from this. Um, they go to jail and they eventually win, you know, the, the, the system of rates whereby this kind of equalised rates were paid by poor boroughs and rich boroughs was actually changed as a result of their stand. Um, and Poplar Council ended up becoming quite a model for its um, social services. Uh, went from being a desperately poor borough to being, in many ways, quite a, quite an exemplar. But a lot of the kind of things that the that, that popular were kind of fighting for were actually implemented by their greatest adversary. So the kind of the Labour Party, the kind of London Labour Party is a kind of thing that you could join, really, as a kind of real political entity rather than the coalition, really dates from about 1918. It doesn't really exist before then. And you have this sort of scattered infrastructure of the progressives, the ILP, the Social Democratic Federation, uh, the Socialist Party, which then becomes the Communist Party, and so on. Um, so the um, Morrison, basic Herbert Morrison, becomes the kind of head of this of, of this party, and he makes it his business to purge communists, basically. Which and along with this kind of purge of communists is this kind of resistance to the idea that London Labour government should in involve themselves in direct action. Morrison had more the idea that they should kind of use the existing bureaucratic machinery. But um, when the Labour Party finally wins power in the LCC in 1934, they embark upon a pretty much the program that Poplar had, had fought on. Um, with extensive social services, with healthcare free at the point of use, uh, 
over, well over a decade before the NHS. Um, with mass council housing built to uh, much larger quantities and to much higher quality. Um, things like Lido's, parks, you know, there's a, there's a kind of massive kind of expansion that hugely increases the quality of life in London and basically makes it a one party state for about 30 years. Um, Labour don't fall below 50% of the vote in London until really the mid 60s, um, very much more like the late 60s. Um, and the third of these kind of um, social movement meets bureaucracy moments that I want to talk about is the one that Hillary is, 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 is very well versed in as a, as a, as a participant. Um, and that is the, the new left in the Labour Party that, um, that came in, I think, after 1968. Um, in many ways, it's always kind of a puzzle in a way that that, 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 that happened. I think one of the kind of you know, that after 1968 you would join the Labour Party seems seems counterintuitive, um, but um, but people did. And one of the things that, that 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 came out of that is that after a lot of the kind of old guard were rinsed out in several um, massive defeats in, in in local elections across the 70s, um, that sort of new left with a very different politics committed to not so much to a kind of a uh, status model, but more to do uh, democratization, to kind of anti-bureaucratic politics, to uh, feminism, to gay rights, to um, black power and so forth. That it kind of goes into Labour to a large degree. And that kind of faction of Labour wins power of the GLC in 1981, and then obviously embarks upon an experiment in, um, I guess, in sort of radical bureaucracy for five years until it literally has to be abolished by Margaret Thatcher. And then London becomes the only capital city, I think, in the world to not have its own government for, for, for 14 years until um, the kind of Great London Authority is set up in 2000. So the kind of, then there's kind of two things where I think, two moments where the same thing is sort of tried and doesn't quite work. And the first of those is the kind of second incarnation of Ken Livingston as sort of London's sort of um, strange sort of socialist city boss, which is after 2000, um, when the new London mayoralty, after a failed attempt to rig the election, um, and uh, rig, rig the selection rather, and the Labour Party ends up electing uh, Ken Livingston, gives his victory speech by saying after, you know, 14 years after I so rudely interrupted and so on. No, well, that wasn't it. it was, as I was saying 14 years ago, um, I think was his, his, the first line of his victory speech. Um, so um, that you then have another kind of attempt at creating this radical bureaucracy, but this time there is no social movement underneath it. There is Livingston and there are kind of his handpicked bureaucrats, many of them from the left. Um, but there is nothing really kind of holding him to account. There is not, it's not a moment of a great political involvement. The nearest thing to that really is the anti-war movement in 2003, which Livingston and the, and the, the, the mayoralty more generally were very supportive of. Um, but this was, you know, it was, it was in some ways quite a single issue uh, matter and it didn't, didn't particularly influence how, how, how Livingston ran the mayoralty. Um, perhaps, you know, there was some kind of attempt to respond to social movements elsewhere, maybe the famous Venezuelan oil that went, that was in the buses at the time is one example of that. But there was kind of, you know, a head without a body in many ways. Then if one kind of fast forwards to the kind of long and bitter last chapter of the book, which is about the kind of most recent experiences, you have a sort of 68 in miniature, I suppose, um, you know, maybe this is a grand way of putting it, in, in, in 2010 to 2011. You have the student movement that emerges, um, you know, Sachs Millbank down the road from the Millbank estate. Um, and following that, only a few months later, you have the riots of August 2011. So you have these kind of, this kind of moment in the aftermath of the financial crisis. And during austerity, you have these two quite large kind of sort of social ructions that happen. 
and when through what was basically, let's face it, pure bureaucratic accident, the 1980s left ends up in control of the Labour Party in 2015, that movement, that 2010 to 2011 movement, floods into the Labour Party. So um, in theory, given that at that point, as it still does, Labour controlled most of the local authorities in London, as it controls most urban local authorities across the country, or certainly across England and Wales. Um, the one should have seen a similar kind of experiment in sort of the you know the social social movement meets um, meets radical bureaucracy, as it were, and that, that they would again kind of mesh. And this doesn't really happen. This doesn't really happen. I think there's various reasons for that. One of which is. I suppose, again, to kind of use that kind of bad metaphor, rather than the kind of head without the body, this time there's a head and there's feet and there's nothing in between it. There's a kind of, you know, there, there, there's this kind of void underneath Corbyn and Macdonnell and Abbott. There's this, there's this kind of, all of whom kind of, you know, London left us in the 1980s or very closely involved with the GLC, obviously Macdonnell in particular. Um, but there's this kind of empty space beneath them. And then there's a sort of social movement, which in many ways ends up being about defending the leadership rather than doing much, much else in many ways, which is not really a critique as, as, as such as it was just the thing that was constitutive. It was because, you know, it's a thing that kind of happened rather than that I want to kind of moralize over. So there were sort of scattered kind of challenges to what by that point had become not just a bureaucratic labor establishment in cities, but had become a neoliberal labor establishment in cities. Councils like Newham and Southwark and Lambeth, um, uh, you know, were, were no longer even meaningly reformist. They were very much the kind of vanguard of the neoliberal transformation of, of, of London, where you know regarded social housing as an obstacle, as a thing to kind of sweep away and destroy in favour of a kind of new kind of global city of shiny luxury apartments and, 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 and so forth, of kind of the money from the city and Canary Wharf kind of sloshing through it. Um, so it was very, very clear what the who the enemy were, there. And there were certain successes, most obviously in Haringey, in defeating the Haringey development vehicle that would have involved the privatisation of most of the boroughs, housing estates, and most likely their demolition and their replacement with uh, market housing. Um, and in a more quiet way, in Southwark and Newham, they're kind of very, very right wing um, leaderships under Peter John and Robin Wales were, were kind of replaced with um, I think more sort of soft left leaderships as they as they currently are, um, but there were no real kind of interesting experiments. There was nothing on the level of what happened in, in what was happening in Preston at this point with community wealth building and so on. Again, some councils are now looking at this, but it was very much not an era of great kind of socialist experiment in the boroughs. So really, what the book was trying to do, just to kind of finish before we go to to Hillary is kind of say, right, this is what we do now. This is, you know, that, that now that, that leadership has been has been taken out um, after the catastrophic defeat in December, which actually was not a catastrophic defeat in London, um, where Labour still very, very easily won a, plural, won a very large plurality in the city. Um, you know, that, that, that there are more than double the Labour MPs in London than there are Tory MPs. Um, that in the aftermath of that defeat, it was kind of looking at, okay, well, we still have all of these cities, we still have all of these town halls, still have all these municipalities. There is a social movement that was put, that was in place to kind of defend the leadership of Corbyn and McDonnell and Abbott. Maybe we can now put that social movement to work in those places, in those local authorities, not just sort of stopping them from doing egregious shit, which they were doing a lot of, but of kind of pioneering a positive program. So that's the gist of the book, really. That's that's what it's trying to do. Um, whether or not um, I think any of it is plausible, I don't know. I think it might be, um, but that's an argument for another time, perhaps. Um, and anyway, I'm enormously interested to know what Hillary makes of all of this because um, her work was ridiculously influential on 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 what I was what I was doing. I think in many ways both Beyond the Fragments and, um, and uh, Tale of Two Parties are very much about 
this kind of question of, of social movements facing the question of power and what they do when they face the question of power. Um, and also there was a book which I think is much less read, which I, which, which, which I drew on a lot, called A Taste of Power, which was about the GLC experience, um, which Hilary co-wrote, um, and about particularly its experiments in, in, in democratic socialist planning. Um, and that one, I think, is it, it's, it's pretty wild, that book. Um, and I'm always sort of intrigued to know where all of that, all of that went. Um, because the Greater London Enterprise Board that it was kind of, that, that, were, that was um, funding a lot of these projects and, and maintaining a lot of them, actually survived the GLC for a few years. But anyway, I don't want to preempt any of it, so I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Owen. Hilary, we're looking forward to hearing from you. So look, there's so much to say that I'm going to time myself. So I'm putting on a timer. Um, okay, start. Okay, so <laughs> anyway, it's, um, it's just, the book is absolutely wonderful. I mean, I, I began reading it ages ago and liked it. In fact, I feel very guilty because Owen wanted me to sort of, you know, make any corrections and and I just enjoyed it so much I didn't. And there are one or two names, you know, they're one or two things that are, need a, are not quite accurate, but they're nothing to do with the main argument. And, and, and actually as a book, I mean, particularly during lockdown, I mean, it's the two things that are just such a pleasure. One is, you know, when you're, I don't know about everybody here, maybe, and, and I mustn't assume everybody's from London because they're not, many people from Canada and, and, and Manchester, which I also love and, and worked in. Um, but even if you just come to London, and I'm not a Londoner, I'm uh, I'm from Leeds, and I actually somebody asked me what would your 70 year old no your 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 18 year old self in 1968 think about your 70 71 year old self? Um, would he would they be pleased? And I said, well, in one respect, they'd be appalled that I'd come to live in London. You know, I never thought of myself as a Londoner, and actually the experience of the GLC contributed to me not feeling that living in London was a complete sellout because in 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 the experience of the GLC very much um confirming what Owen is saying about about um London as a municipal centre, working class city, I really, you know, I lost all that feeling about London as simply the capital, you know, um or even, you know, a sense in which the London left is particularly important or you know it just became to me a city like like Leeds or like Newcastle where I used to live or, or like Manchester um, and um, anyway so the, what I'm, I was just going to say what, what the other wonderful thing about the book is that that if if you are a Londoner or if you just visit London, London you know that the, the pleasure of going out and not being in the house was just you know if you go and just have a meal with somebody or go to a meeting in the course of that physical adventure you you come across all these things you just didn't know these graveyards or or historic buildings or places where where really interesting things happen and you just find yourself completely engrossed with just the the physical the kind of physical history of london and and owen just evokes that i mean it's a very it's a very political book but it's also a very erudite book it's it, he just draws on all his knowledge of architecture of the, the detail of london as a as a city anyway i just can't recommend it more highly um and um so just on i mean the, the other thing now from what he said is that this framing in terms of <clears throat> as a relationship between social movements and bureaucracy I think is really interesting and certainly does um, sum up a lot of what was happening at the, at the GLC. I first should say that um, this notion of the, the generation of 68 joining the Labour Party, I think is a little bit, it's more complex. I mean, I never joined the Labour Party. Sheila Robotham maybe did, but hadn't then. Um, and and uh, I don't I think and Lynn Siegel has now um, I mean, both of us mainly since Corbyn was elected, um, which poses dilemmas about now. But um, the the key thing about the GLC in a sense was that you were never asked your party card for your party card. I mean, it was a very un sorry. This is my I don't know how I deal with that. It's just bits announcement. Um, 
you know, in a, a key feature of Livingston's leadership, but also the other councillors that we worked with, is that they, it was very uncontrolling. It really respected our autonomy. So um, most of us who were appointed as political advisors were not in the Labour Party. Sorry, I've got a bit of a sore throat. Um, and so, but on the other hand, I agree that some people did did join the Labour Party, and and in a way, the the um, the taking over of the Labour Party was a result of of people who, <coughs> in a way, were shaped by '68. But then, people like George Nicholson and Michael Ward, who were councillors and who facilitated the kinds of things that um, Owen's describing, the kinds of policies that that in a way led to abolition, the kind of complete subversion of a normal um, role of a local government, which was to manage. And in a sense, we turned it into the basis of a struggle and a struggle that was characterised by resistance, but resistance combined with an alternative, a positive alternative, and a kind of prefiguration of what might be possible. And those councillors had both been shaped by 68 but also they'd been very involved in movements in London around land, particularly. I mean, George Nicholson had been key in the struggle of Coin Street, um, you know, which was basically a community struggle against uh, office speculation that the GLC backed and used its power. I mean, in a way, that was a typical example of our rela the relationship of the GLC to social movements, that we supported social movements we respected their autonomy, and then with them we negotiated what powers did we have that they didn't have and that could sort of enable them to implement what they wanted. So the, in the case of, of Coin Street, we used compulsory purchase powers to, to buy Coin Street, which we then handed over to the community trust. So again, an example of how, you know, we didn't presume to be the engineers of socialism. Socialism was about sharing power, not about um, social movements electing us and then we delivered to them. So it wasn't a sort of delivery notion of local government. It was a, a, a kind of a struggle movement, almost the, the, we felt we were appointed by Livingston and Mike Ward and so on because we were part of a movement, not because we were you know, good bureaucrats uh, or good, you know, technicians. We were there because we'd come from the social movements. And in a way, the GLC, you know, perhaps because it was a strategic authority um, and not a, and not, and didn't so much deliver, um, particularly after housing had been taken from it, didn't deliver services. We, our powers were kind of limited. We, we didn't have powers of delivery we had strategic powers and in the case of Docklands where we we did something quite interesting we developed or that we supported the people developing a people's plan for the Royal Docks um, an alternative to the airport effectively and we had no powers not even planning powers there because Thatcher had abolished all our planning powers this was before abolition he she'd um, taken away all our planning powers all the local authorities' planning powers, and introduced the, the London Developments Corporation, which was basically a kind of corporation to allow Canary Wharf and all the private developments, including the airport. And so we are approaching popular planning, <clears throat> which again is, is sort of interesting because it's a break from the normal idea that, you know, <clears throat> the local authority has a plan and then convenes meetings in schools with chairs where which nobody can fit, you know, and um, asks them, what do you think of our plan? You know, yes or no kind of thing. <clears throat> Instead, our brief was to identify where people were resisting on the basis that where people are resisting, they've got some idea of what it could be, what, what could be that is not at present the case. Um, and then to support the alternatives that that, that were implicit in their in their resistance. So my first kind of job uh, uh, in the popular planning unit, or a job that we you know we we the popular planning unit was was 
was run on social movement lines. And actually, the whole of our department, the industry and employment department, led by the visionary Robin Murray, who, about whom there's a wonderful website, um, robinmurray.co, um, dot organization, dot, dot co dot UK, yeah. And anyway, it's really worth reading because he he was key to, to what we did. And he was very much uh, like we all were. We were people, we were 68 in office, if you like. Um, but it was it was autonomous from the Labour Party in one sense, although we depended on the on the success of the Labour Party electorally. But we were we were part of movements that that maintained their autonomy uh, while you know working with the GLC, and I think that was important and may be important for now. Um, but but our approach was to, to 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 kind of connect with movements. So I I went and sat in on a movement that was opposing the airport and the the principle was to say so you know what what how could we help you you know we, we had an electoral mandate against um an airport and for maintaining some kind of transport hub including a small dock facility so we were acting within the mandate of an electoral body but we were deepening that democracy by actually building a collaborative relationship um, with the people. And I think that was the principle all along. Now, um, I was just trying to think, I've probably not got much longer, I'll just check. Um, and I should maybe just concentrate on what its implications are for now. I think the first thing to say is that, you know, the conditions that we worked under were so completely different. I mean, you could say that we could see then with the abolition with the um, abolition of the GLC and the defeat which followed the defeat of the miners, we could see kind of what was coming. In some ways, it, it very much, um, you know, um, links to what Owen's been saying, because just as the first LCC was linked to the victory of the of the dockers, um, the demise of the GLC was linked to the defeat of the miners. So the two things the, the defeat of, a, of a, a significant social movement, the trade union movement, uh, and the defeat of the GLC kind of um, went together. Um, but I should also say that um, the other condition that was completely different from now, and we mustn't forget it, is that we had masses of resources. I mean, money was not a problem. You know, the popular planning unit, I mean, probably we had a budget of over a million to support local people you know, to give them grants, you know, to be able to set up a people's plan centre, employ local people to develop the plan, you know, all these things that that that, that we were able to do. We, we were able to fund workers to have time off um, in, say, the furniture industry, to have workshops, to develop alternative plans for that industry. So we had masses of resources, which, you know, not since then, there's been a war. I mean, the war was opened up, you could say, by abolition. And since then, the the right, both the conservative right and the Labour right, including Tony Blair, or particularly Tony Blair and the new Labour, have been about destroying local government. So it's pretty amazing that local government has, has survived. So that resource constraint is really um, crucial. But I think that... Um, there are one or two principles that maybe we can kind of draw from the GLC to to implement the kind of very positive, hopeful vision that um, Owen has in, uh, towards the end of his book, which we could discuss in more detail. I think one is, and maybe in a way the COVID experience kind of um, increases this, that, that, that now, in a way, lo local authorities realize that, that their main ally, as we realize at the GRC, is is local people and the kind of civic organizations that people create. Um, you know, we were this is the basis on which we worked. So we had a very big grant giving organization <coughs> that gave grants to women's resource centers, trade union resource centers, um kind of legal legal aid centres, all kinds of anti-racist centres, police monitoring groups, you know, all sorts of autonomous organisations. And that was very important in terms of a, a notion of the Labour Party and Labour local authorities as not 
managing everything, but actually sharing power and sharing resources. And I think we're beginning to see this in local government now, where I think there could be a shift towards a purely delivery model to a kind of more collaborative model. <clears throat> I mean, for example, in Hackney, which I'm not saying is like some beacon, but it's interesting that there they've got a youth commission and that's been inspired by initiatives by young people in Hackney, sort of making demands as to what they want to see. And the council has created this commission in which young people and their organisations actually kind of manage um, council resources, <coughs> or play a key role in managing council resources towards young people and to defining policy. And I think, you know, that's, I mean, that's not, thorough going. It's not yet happened really in housing in Hackney, but I think that idea of collaborating and supporting um, local initiatives, I mean, say in relation to food, you know, the government, as with Test and Trace, had a completely corrupt and hopeless, so I've got to pretty much stop, but um, system of, of, you know, giving out food parcels that were totally inadequate, totally insensitive to different diets, totally, totally inadequate. And the Hackney instead did its own um, its own um, food sort of supply based on on people's needs, people's desires, and then now is supporting community restaurants, subsidising um, community facilities, community food provision. And you could imagine local authorities across the country developing a kind of national food service in the way that it's been argued for and. It was, I think it was even in the Labour Party manifesto, but it could be prefigured at a local level, not because of the great powers of local government, but because local government could now play a sort of supportive and help coordinating role with, with local municipal, not municipal, civic sort of associations. So I think that's one of the ways to go. I think a final point in my last sort of two minutes or so is to do with the trade unions. I think that in some ways, in, in explaining this division that, that um, Owen describes between social movements and bureaucracy or political power, I think that's got its roots in the origins of the Labour Party in the trade unions, which, although it was a closeness that brought the, the, part, the Labour Party into being, it was then a closeness that was based on a very rigid division of Labour, i.e. the unions don't get involved in politics. Thus, the Labour Party was nationally was pretty hostile to the general strike. Um, and um, uh, the, um, the, the Labour Party doesn't interfere with, with industrial relations. So that the unions were very hostile to when the Labour Party tried to impose an incomes policy and, and um, restrict union powers. And that, that's been a very rigid division, leading to in some ways a very a political trade unionism and a very sort of paternalist Labour Party. Now, the thing about the GLC is that that broke. So um, they broke partly because of the impact of 68 and a radical shop stewards movement. And so the, a very clear example was this initiative that Owen talks about, the Lucas Aerospace Alternative Plan, where workers in the in, faced with redundancies didn't say, oh, well, this is a matter of the Labour Party's industrial strategy. No, they said in the end, after talking to Tony Benn, who, who again didn't see the Labour Party as being separate from the unions, and he got involved with the unions and said to them, so what do you want? Do you want nationalisation of the aerospace components industry or, or, or do you have your own ideas? And they came up with their own plan for how their machinery, their skills could be used to make socially useful products rather than military products. And then this idea, this idea of workers as being knowledgeable people, and this is the argument of my New Politics from the Left book, but, you know, they're people that aren't just wage earners, but are producers with skills and capacities that could be the basis of an alternative kind of socialism. And that was the idea carried into the GLC by... Mike Cooley, one of the leaders of the um, of the uh, Lucas Aerospace Plan, who with whom I did a job share in the first few weeks of the GLC, but in the end we both 
ended up working kind of, you know, from dawn till till dusk. So we, we became both full time. Um, but that influenced all our thinking and that idea of the trade unions as being themselves political, not just delegating politics to the Labour Party, um, you know, influenced the trade unions throughout London, who were, you know, they were they were quite powerful until, you know, Thatcher really got going and really started to attack them. So that was another thing that the trade unions were strong. But I mean, now, OK, the trade unions aren't strong, but we do have the emergence of a new kind of trade unionism in the IWGB and other independent unions that are highly political, were very supportive of Corbyn and are creating a new kinds of um, a new kind of economic action, a new kind of economic thinking. So I better end there, but I think that um, Owen's book provides at the end a really useful and provocative and challenging sort of manifesto for um, a red metropolis. Thank you so much, Hilary, and and thank you, Owen. Um, I'm hoping that without uh, giving uh, a spoiler, we can uh, get to that uh, five point manifesto before the end of the evening. Uh, but chair's privilege. I wanted to ask a question of both of you, actually. Um, talk about the issue about the London left, generational divides and housing. Oh, and you, you mentioned in the book that, that of course, and, and I'm, I'm sure Hillary can speak to this as well, um, during the time of the GLC um, prior, um, ha housing and its scarcity was not the issue that it is now. Um, oh, and you also talk about being at a Southwark transformed meeting, a ve very vivid portrait of something many of us will recognize where, um, as you say, it seemed to confirm a certain stereotype about the London left. On the one hand, it's obsessed with solving questions over which it had no power. Um, Palestine on the one hand for one group and um, prisons on the other. So you talk about um, this group of activists splitting up, the older people go upstairs to talk about Palestine, Israel, um, younger members talk about abolishing prisons and only a handful of people are talking about housing and about these issues. Why is it given, given that this affects life in London more than almost anything else at the present moment, there is so little focus on. In fact, the only people that I see in labor who are at all interested in housing are the labor right and for en enormously malevolent reasons, because as you say, they're using it as their North, North Sea oil rather than uh, leaving it in the ground. So when someone in labor says they're interested in housing, uh, I can usually tell by the cut of their jib <laughs> um, <laughs> who it will be. So um, yeah. why, I, I understand if you own your own home or it's not been an issue and, and you're, you're older then then of course other issues may be more salient. And perhaps if you're younger and moving around a lot, I mean, I've noticed this in, in CLPs, great young activists are either driven out by right-wingers um, with hostility or they're moving all the time because they're going from one overplaced tip to another. So the people who remain in, in CLPs are the people who've been there forever. So why is housing not more of a concern? Um, has it been co-opted by the kind of Lib Dem generation rent mob? And okay. what can you about it? Yeah, uh, I have various things to say on that. Um, I suppose there's two questions, one of which is about the, time, the, the, the previous period, one of which is about now. Um, in terms of councillors who say they're interested in housing, a lot of the time what they mean is they're interested in development, which is... Um, Similar, but not quite the same. Um, so there is an implicit critique in the book, and I'd be very interested in, 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 in Hillary's opinion on it, of the GLC in the 80s as policies on housing and of much, much more to the point where I think it was a disaster, Livingston's policies on housing when he was mayor, um, which I think he, he still, you know, missed a historic opportunity to um, to sort out a lot of London's housing problems. So trying to take the kind of one by, and then there's the kind of question about now and the, whether or not it's a big thing. Now, um, I'm actually kind of keen to take the, the, the second one on first. I'm a bit embarrassed about that passage. Um, and I would probably be, although everything in it is true, 
Um, and also among the people who was in the group in the middle that stayed for the housing bit was um, Piers Corbyn. So, um, I, you know, that, that, that probably says something about the calibre of um, people that were interested in talking about housing in Southwark. Um, he, I, I got what I first thought was a heckle from him and then I realised it was supportive. Um, anyway, moving on from that. Um, so I don't think, I actually think housing was a very major issue, but mainly among the young and, and among the kind of young generation of people that came in to Corbynism was very much an issue. It took ages and ages and ages to get a decent policy on housing into the Labour Manifesto, um, to get a policy that was not even radical, but was on the same level as the Scottish Parliament. That took fucking years of lobbying. Um, there's a really interesting kind of aside in um, the, the Historic Materialism Conference, which is all online, of Mary Robertson, who was in the kind of Shadow Chancellor's office at the time, talking about, you know, trying to get things past um, then, the then Shadow Housing Secretary and how incredibly difficult this was. Um, but by the time there actually was a good line, it was a young Labour, it was a, a young Labour um, motion. It was almost verbatim from a young Labour motion. Um, and within that, I had a extremely minor role. Um, I think it's fair to say there was a, a particular Tribune piece that was supposed to be taken into a Clause 5 meeting. And I think that was the, the first and only time I've ever had any political influence in my entire life. And anyway, then we completely got destroyed in that election. So no one will probably ever look at that housing policy ever again. Um, but I think it was very good. And I think it was adopted completely at the behest of the young. And it was adopted at the behest of what is obviously the labor base, which is uh, young people. Um, it is um, a kind of multicultural, urban and young vote. And that's probably about 30% of the country, which is never going to be enough to win a general election ever. Um, but that's who we got out. That was that's that's the base. That's the and 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 they I think were very supportive of that of that policy. I think in terms of why there were the people going upstairs to talk about Palestine, the people going into the gardens to talk about prison abolition, and why the people that stayed in the hall were talking about housing. Um, I should say it was very sunny. It was during that long heat wave when it didn't rain for about six weeks in uh, twenty eighteen. So the prison abolition people were also sunbathing to a degree. Um, but the, I suppose that passage lends itself to suggest that the Labour Party couldn't solve these things, which I think is more or less true. I think, you know, although I think it would be good, it was good that there were prison abolitionists who were um, influential with Abbott. It was obvious that Abbott was not going to implement an abolitionist program. Um, although there, I think it's good that there were people who, you know, are, are, are supportive of, of Palestine who were influential. I think, it, you know, it was obvious it's not in Britain's gifts to reverse the, the partition that they had such a crucial role in um, when, when Palestine was a, a British colony in the interwar years. Um, so, um, the reason why I think that wasn't such an issue is people have forgotten what councils can do. So it was always seen as a we can stop a thing, you know, like, like, like with the HTV thing, you know, we, we, we will, this awful thing is happening and we will block it. But then that forgets the other, th the thing that makes a kind of radical bureaucracy interesting in the first place, which is that I can do things. And Coin Street being a wonderful example of that and being, you know, that, that it was able to, to facilitate whether it's done by a kind of, you know, in the kind of LCC way of kind of like, we are going to do a plan here um, or in the kind of 80s GLC way of like, what would you, what plan would you like? Um, it's, you know, it, it facilitates these things, makes these things happen. And people just don't really realise that councils can still substantially do that. Um, they do still have, and actually during this period it was made easier by Theresa May lifting the borrowing cap. Um, I think some of the kind of communitarian Tories around May actually did want to bring council housing back. Um, and we can kind of see the difference now in the fact that I think the kind of, the fact that the kind of Bullingdon, pulling, the Bullingdon kind of policy exchange wing is firmly back in control of the party. You can see that its absence, you know, that, 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 that someone like Robert Jenrick obviously, you know, wants to 
strangle that very small revival in, it, in its cradle. And there has been a small revival. There's been more council housing in London for the last five years than at any time since the 80s. Some of it's very good. Um, so that's with the kind of current thing. That's, that's I suppose, where I stand on that. Um, on the 80s, I think that there's a kind of bit which I used talking to Simon Hanna um, about, about this issue, and it's particularly refer re reference to Lambeth. So in Lambeth, you had, you know, the kind of first of the kind of, um, the kind of new left councils under Ted Knight, which came to power in 1978. Um, which was surprisingly, for me, very confrontational with the architects department that was run by the communist Ted Hollenby. And they built absolutely some of the best housing in London in the 20th century, or in any period, and built phenomenal stuff. Um, lots of which still endures, lots of which is still popular. And actually, if you were to find social movements in London, um, on planning, a lot of the time, the exact place you'll find them is at Cressingham Gardens or at Central Hill. So, so it's the people that are, that, are, that are demanding that that housing be maintained rather than sold off and demolished. So um, th there was a lot of hostility between those two and, and Hollenby eventually felt from his own later account that he was more or less forced out by Ted Knight. Um, this has a happy ending insofar as Ted Knight at the end of his life was deeply involved in the campaign to save Hollenby's Central Hill estate. So, you know, I think it kind of, it kind of goes full circle in a way. Um, was the chair of the Gypsy Hill CLP at the time. But that, for, I was talking to Simon Hanna about it because he's been writing a book about Lambeth. It's very much that the, the, the generation running that council, they hadn't lived in council housing. They lived in squats, they lived in flat shares, um, they lived in the kind of dilapidated Georgian Regency and Victorian property that Lambeth is so, so full of. Um, and they just, you know, put really bluntly, I think many of them, Livingston being a case in point, hadn't really experienced the slums. They hadn't, so they hadn't seen the thing that was being replaced. What they'd seen was empty housing that had been considered slums and then this new stuff being built. And so the kind of, and they hadn't really experienced a, a, a crisis of housing supply or a crisis of housing affordability. So that not, was not the problem. The problem in the 80s was people wanting to democratise their housing, was wanting control over their housing, you know, having, having a kind of say in it, not just in stuff that had already been built, but a say in what would then get built. So Coin Street's a great example of this. Actually, funnily enough, for Coin Street, I think the best stuff they built was actually after the GLC um, uh, was, was, was dissolved. Um, the, the AC sides of Queen Street, I always kind of find like a little bit Basingstoke. Um, but the kind of 1990s phases of it are wonderful around the kind of park that, that faces the, the riverside um, and the flats there and the Oxo Tower and the kind of colonnade they created through it, I think are wonderful. Um, but anyway, I think that was, a, that was a forgivable oversight at the time because of the fact that there wasn't a crisis of housing supply in London. Um, London was still at that point depopulating as it continued to do until pretty much, I think, the first kind of rise in London's population that was really significant comes in the 90s. And then it just, it just grows like topsy. You know, London now is at a historic high and there's nearly at 9 million people. Um, whereas the, 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 the new left in 1981 took hold of a city that I think six and a half million, I think, was the population at that point. Um, so I remember having a, a very interesting conversation when I was working on a different book altogether, which um, was a kind of edited collection about London boroughs, which I worked on for the Open House Festival earlier this year. Um, and I was talking to Nicholas Taylor, who was very much a kind of new left councillor and very kind of inspired by the spirit of 68 in uh, Lewisham. And he had become very influential in the kind of in planning and housing in Lewisham. And it's kind of best known for um, facilitating the self-build schemes in Lewisham, um, led by the architect Walter Siegel, uh, the, the Weimar emigre Walter Siegel, um, which are you know self-built box kit housing that people could then customize and make what they like of. And they're, they're a real kind of cult now, and that they're, they're enormously kind of valued by their residents, but also by um, by kind of architects and anarchists. 
Um, and I was out talking to him about, about them and he was just very much kind of like, you know, would you do this now? And he was like, no, of course I wouldn't. I could do that now because, you know, I could do that then because we had these leftover bits of land, we had a housing surplus and we could just basically kind of go, tell you what, why don't you build the houses? Um, and it was that position of, of surplus and time and land that meant that they could do this. And he said, if I was in, basically it was like, if I was in power in Lewisham now, I would just build a load of council housing because that's what you need to do. You need to kind of get people out of shitty housing, which London is absolutely full of, and get them into decent rented council housing. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, it confirmed several of my suspicions, let's say. Um, and then in the 2000s with Livingston, it's kind of second time as fast, I think, really, that, that, that although the, the GLA actually does have some oversight power over housing and planning, and does have a budget for it, very much the idea was let developers do what they like and then we'll cream off a kind of percentage of affordable housing, um, which wasn't properly defined. Um, so affordable was basically meaningless. You know, affordable could be shared ownership, could be studio flats, could mean whatever the developer wanted it to mean. And then Cameron came in and defined it's 80% of market rent, so it just meant absolutely nothing at that point. Um, and that, you know, that, that meant that there was a real kind of problem of, of housing that was kind of inculcated that then in Livingston's second term and under Boris Johnson, Sadiq Khan has become, you know, an endemic crisis in London, um, to which it's fairly obvious the major solution is a, a state-backed programme of, of council building. And I think one wouldn't do it in the same way that the LCC did in the 40s and 50s and 60s, wouldn't do it in the same way. But I think one can learn a lot about what they did get right and also about what they got wrong. Um, we have three yeah. fantastic um, questions. I'm, I'm sorry, Hilary. Um, oh, no, I just was going to add just two things to, to what um, Owen said. One is obviously about now to stress the importance of the renters' union, which mm. has grown up. And, and that has been very much stimulated by um, activists in momentum and and sort of Corbynistas who have not necessarily put their energies into the Labour Party, but have, you know, as was the original kind of claim of momentum, put energies into building movements. And that's happened in some areas. So the renters' movement, I think, and it seems to be growing, you know, considerably. So that's a kind of important life force. And then on the kind of the history, I think one thing that's happened that you've, you've just now reflected on, and I just put it into sort of the wider context of um, the influence of both New Labour and before that sort of how do you survive under Thatcher? And it kind of led to um, a sort of apolitical compromise with developers. So um, that's now got to a level of, of uh, almost, I mean, at times corruption and other times just um, sort of fatalism. So um, even in Haringey, you know, I don't know the details, but it seems like the story that you tell of the Latin American village and, you know, the fact that the council, although it was radical, it wasn't prepared to break with the developer. You know, this sort of idea that somehow the deals with developers is the answer and the source of, of funding. And I mean, it's obviously a result of a beleaguered situation, but it's also... I think a result of a rather apolitical idea of managing local councils that's that's got its origins in 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 Tony Blair's approach, which did sort of depoliticize um local government. I mean, I don't know if people remember the New Deal for Communities, which was a kind of involved a degree of popular participation, but it was like it was like over the heads of local government. So it was trying to sort of reach the people without the politics of local government, which they were scared of because it was usually coming from the radical left. So um, I think that points to the importance of, of sort of repoliticizing, um, you know, the, the, the leadership of local councils and, and not looking for technical solutions, which actually are not technical because we know developers in the end, you know, they've got their own private interests. And 
I think that this is what links to the this point I was trying to make about a collaborative approach to <clears throat> to local government, and this implies housing as well, where <clears throat> the local government would actually the local councillors would work with the local people and spend as much time, preferably more time, working with them. Whereas at the moment they are working with developers. You know, developers are having meetings and getting work done by by local authorities, all on the assumption that, as you say, the local authority will be able to cream off some money. Whereas, in fact, if they started working with the local people and that put pressure on the developers um, and in turn also pressure on the council for, for proper council housing, that would be much more productive. Anyway, I'll leave it to other questions. So we've got um, we've got about twenty minutes and uh, three excellent questions. Um, I'll um, I think they all need to be asked separately. So so if you don't mind, um, the first one is from Julia, who's an Enfield resident, and um, she notes that she's concerned about the Meridian Water development. Um, it doesn't have enough affordable housing, and the local campaign isn't getting any traction. Um, uh, Hilary or Owen, do you have any advice about challenging aspects of big developments? And um, she notes that she loves the development's involvement of local makers and in incorporating a light manufacturing site. Um, Owen, you're on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sorry, I, I spotted that. Um, I, I suppose with a lot of things like that, I sort of take them on a case by case basis. And I, I, I'm. It's a bit inveterately um, South London centric, um, so I, I don't know enough about about this one. Um, in terms of challenging big developments, um, obviously Harringay, you know, despite I think the fact that they that they buggered things up quite a bit on the Latin Village later on, is quite a positive example of that. The huge campaign against GHTV, which was a huge scheme in the first place. Um, you know, led to pretty much the only successful kind of cooing of a of, of a right wing council in that in that period. Um, and again, you know, rather than kind of selling off all their council housing, they are now building council housing in Harringay, um, and in proper kind of eighties GLC style, it has sort of radical nomenclature. So they're working on a Joy Gardener house right now. I saw on the on their Twitter account the other day. So, you know, and I, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm very critical of them on the Latin village, but that did make a difference. So something like that, those kind of big campaigns were really, really successful. Um, there's one now actually, which is not, which I've been keeping quite, in, which I've been keeping in touch with, which over the Bishopsgate Goodyard in Hackney, and sorry, well, sort of on the borders of, of Hackney and Tower Hamlets, where the city kind of meets the Eastern which literally just this evening was approved by the Mayor of London, which I find incredibly depressing. Um, it's absolutely, you know, the sort of thing where, you know, any kind of reforming municipality would look at that and go like, right, both the local councils hate it, residents hate it, there's been a campaign against it for years, there's a good counter proposal, in this case from David Chipperfield of all people, let's do that instead. And it's publicly owned land, right, easy. And Khan has basically caved into developers for a scheme which is basically a luxury hotel and luxury flats for a city which is no longer going to need luxury hotels and luxury flats for a scheme of chain retail and chain restaurants in a landscape where chain retail and restaurants are going to be mostly bankrupt. I mean, I was just <laughs> trying not to think about it this evening because I was just like, how can you be still doing this stuff? Um, so sometimes you win them and sometimes you lose them. I suppose that's one example where they won and one example where they didn't. Um, and I think the fact that in the in the Harringay case, it was on sort of two prongs. You know, it had a kind of local kind of activist element, and it also had a voice within the Labour Party that was quite strong. So it was able to both be inside and outside, and that I think is why it won. Um, but then there's always the possibility that the mayor will just call something in and let it happen anyway. But Enfield is an interesting council in some ways. They've been doing some more interesting stuff than a lot of places. Um, but again, you know, I, I, I can't really talk about it. So yeah. Uh, okay, no, I agree. I mean, I think the key thing is what can be learned from the Haringey uh, campaign and, and, and therefore the strength of resistance, which I think... <clears throat> 
is not just about people on the streets, but the strength of argument. So the um, the importance of expertise that can that can dissect a plan. I mean the 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 H V D H D V plan. I can't remember the initials exactly, but you know it. it I mean, at first it was sailing through the council. It wasn't until one or two councillors really applied themselves to dissecting it. And in a sense, we need a <clears throat> we need a sharing of those kinds of resources and capacities. I mean, I think there's a um, a lot of um, sharp thinking going on in Newham, you know, using uh, investigative journalists and academics. And I think so we need to pool the resources that there are on the left of investigative journalists of academics who've done work on housing um including you know people like owen and um and 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 link that capacity to the the capacity and knowledge of local people and local campaigns so it's really sort of upping the game of you know of local campaigns so that it's really um a powerful force that can also then put pressure on 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 what's left of the left inside the Labour Party. Well, work with the left inside the Labour Party to put pressure on a, a rather unresponsive leadership. Thanks. Two more questions. Uh, one here from Jonathan. Uh, Hilary is reflecting on your experience of the GLC. Uh, would like to know what you think the roots of anarchist thinking within London municipalism are. Um, he says he's thinking of Colin Ward style engagement with planning, public services and housing and suggests maybe this is the root of another book. Yes, I mean, I, I think that uh, influence was there. I mean, for me, it came more through the feminist movement, because I think um, a lot of the thinking of the women's movement, maybe not directly influenced by anarchist theory though Sheila would probably um you know say more because she 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 definitely studied Colin Ward and um and, and I mean I think all of us admired him and and saw him as a as a sort of writer and thinker to to look up to and and learn from um but I think that whole I the whole critique of the state um that underpinned feminism that was about, I mean, in some ways, this idea of being in and against the state has a, a root in feminism, because on the one hand, we, we needed public resources, you know, the, i.e. the redistribution of wealth that, that, that the, the welfare state involved. So we needed public resources, but we, we were critical of the way those public resources were, were managed and administered and the social relations involved in that administration. So we were highly critical of the state itself. And so when we actually got jobs in the state, you know, it was like, oh my God, what do we do? And I mean, what we did was really just kind of carry on acting like, like social movement activists. I mean, sometimes we would get told off, but we always had the backing of Livingston and Mike Ward and George Nicholson and, our, you know, our managers. I mean, it was, you know, as, as, as Owen knows, I mean, it was gross, you know, the, the, the sort of hierarchy, the bureaucracy was, it was kind of militarily based. I mean, I remember the most dramatic thing was, <clears throat> you know, in these, this huge building, there was one floor that was the members floor and it was all polished and, you know, oak panelled and, and sometimes, you know, I, I would just wander up there to see Mike Ward, you know, just thinking it was like just another floor, the next floor up. And <clears throat> I was looking a bit scruffy because I'd been used to working at home, so I, I didn't have any sort of power suits. Anyway, so I would be I would be up there and then somebody would come up to me, somebody official sort of I mean I was official, but they they thought I wasn't. They said you know, so what are you doing up here? You know, as if like, how how can somebody like you be up here? And I and I said, well, I'm just going to see Mike Ward, and and he said, you have to do that through your senior officer. And I said, well, I think I am a senior officer. And it was sort of like, you know, everything was meant to be through the hierarchy, and very quickly, you know, the 
Livingston um, and the other councils completely broke that down. So there was a sort of, you know, in a way, we were anarchist in spirit. I mean, we, but on the other hand, we did recognise the need for some kind of state action to redistribute wealth, to confront the wealthy. I mean, Coin Street, you know, in some ways, the community campaign was very, I wouldn't, I don't know about anarchist, but it was libertarian. It was, it was about the creativity of the people. I'm sure Colin Ward would have, I'm sure did really like it and appreciate it. But then we needed to ally that creativity, that anarchist impetus, with the power of the state to buy that land as, and make it public in order for that creativity to be realised. So I think you need state action against capital and then you need popular action, popular organisation, popular power. Many of the ideas um, of anarchism sort of, you know, uh, reinforce that, uh, to actually make use of that public resource. I don't know, that doesn't answer, but I mean, it wasn't a very direct theoretical influence, but I think Colin Ward um, probably would be an influence on, I mean, maybe maybe the planning people as well, George Nicholson and Drew Stevenson and others, you know, because I think a lot of the creativity of the GLC came from outside. It wasn't really just to do with the councillors or the political officers. It was actually that we made the GLC very porous to the ideas of people like Colin Ward or people influenced by Colin Ward. I don't know if you'd agree, Owen. I, I, I can completely see that. I think one of the things that's interesting about the 80s, though, is that both the right and the left are into Colin Ward. Um, so Docklands and the idea of non-plan, the idea that if you just kind of take an area and remove all planning restrictions from it, which is what happened in, 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 in Docklands, that, you know, that that actually had, in a way, you can trace a line in Colin Ward that leads to Canary Wharf. And you can trace a line in Colin Ward that leads to Coin Street. And that's what makes it such an interesting, interesting moment is that that kind of lots of those kind of ideas become part of the libertarian right. And they also become part of a libertarian left. And obviously, you know, one gets abolished and one then becomes, you know, one of the world's major financial centers. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of there. I think I would only add a cautionary note, which is that I would be mortified if any contemporary council was reading Colin Ward for ideas about what to do with London and housing in 2020. Um, I think, going back to the Nicholas Taylor point, it's an idea for what you do when, when you've already removed privation and shortage um, and unfortunate. And those are the three things we currently face, and we face them in an in, in enormous um, number right now. I have another question, this one from uh, someone whose last name is Ward, but uh, not Colin. It's uh, Callum Ward, who's um, interested in asking, to what extent does the collapsing council revenues following the pandemic circumscribe this kind of municipal policy experimentation that you're talking about? Is there no money left because COVID? Um, I don't really think that's... Um, I mean... One of the things that's happening now is that you can basically borrow for free. Um, that had been true for a while due to interest rates being kept so low, and the pandemic has actually made that even more the case. So it's true only if you subscribe to a particular kind of fallacy about the way state funding works, which is that there's a kind of pot of money and then you spend it and, you know, you raise it from taxation and you kind of, you kind of distribute it around. Um, you know, a lot of things like this were funded through borrowing, um, particularly the kind of um, sort of stuff that the kind of more Keynesian things from the 30s to the 70s. Um, and there's no reason whatsoever. I mean, no, there's literally no better time for a, a government to borrow ever. Like, you know, like local authorities and government should be borrowing an absolute ton of money and building a load of housing. Like, um, and, and that actually, the pandemic is neither here nor there. Um, so there's something, I suppose, about the um, 
the way that there's a kind of false austerity written into council budgets. They're not able to do the things that central government can do. Um, although the lifting of the borrowing cap changes that slightly. Um, the thing that I'm much more worried by is Robert Jenrick's reforms um, to the planning system, which basically abolish it. Um, and that, that I think will have much worse effects actually long-term than the pandemic itself. I think the pandemic actually, um, as Hillary has kind of suggested, actually had quite positive effects on the way local government was perceived. A lot of people um, could see that local government was much better at, at managing their, their needs, at kind of responding to their needs than central government was. Um, obviously, the kind of little mini rebellion in, in Greater Manchester is very much an example of that. Um, the fact that that was based, you know, that preceding that, preceding Andy Burnham telling the government to piss off, was the you know, the Greater Manchester track and trace system being much more successful than the than the, than the kind of centralised Circo plus Westminster one. Yeah. So no is my answer to that. Now, Hillary, you mentioned. Um, before I had a chance to wave my hands about it, but I'm equally excited. But the uh, the five points that conclude this fantastic book. Um, and um, I should note for any of you who are interested, Houseman's is opening up again physically um, with limitations on the people who can be there. Um, it's good to be there in person. <laughs> so I do recommend anyone who's close enough to do so, um, um, please, go down and um, plenty of Hillary's and Owen's books available there. But so Hillary, as you mentioned, Owen concludes the book with um, five things to be hopeful about. Uh, um, we've got just a few minutes left. I'd love to hear from both of you on them. Do you, do you still hold to these? Um, I have to remember what they were. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> I've got I read out the, <laughs> shall I read out the headings? And then Owen can uh, elaborate. So London needs to look outwards. So really that was just about like, you know, that there's often this idea that, that people in Britain have much lower expectations of, of housing and public space and, 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 and employment than most other people in most rich Northern European countries. Even on a capitalist level, Britain is an outlier for how miserable it is in a lot of ways. And so it was really a kind of like, go to Vienna, go to Paris, um, go to Berlin and look at what they're doing in housing and learn from it. That's what that was about. OK, the next one is London needs to stop. This is a, this is a thing that will annoy people, I think, if they're, or at least annoy a certain contingent of people especially because lots of the kind of McDonald program, which I otherwise very, very, was very supportive of, was based upon growth. And it's also something that's in the kind of current London plan, which isn't all bad, um, but very much has this kind of insistence on growth, 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 growth. You cannot, like what a kind of London of 10 million plus looks like is what currently, you know, the Elephant and Castle looks like. It's 40 storey blocks of luxury flats, you know, um, demolished housing estates, green space obliterated, and, you know, loads of bankrupt branches of Franco Manca. Um, and I think that that is, you know, it's a thing that also has problematic effects on the rest of the country, you know, that, that, that you know, the, the, the kind of endless growth and kind of swelling of the London economy, uh, when style. Um, you know, it happens at a time of great decline in, in lots of the rest of the country. Um, and everyone knows that, and that's why they hate us. Um, well, partly because, you know, they're, 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 they, they, they just don't understand, but also it's because of that. Um, so that was really about that. And it kind of came from a lecture which I saw about the, the, the late um, mayor of Seoul, um, who committed suicide earlier this year. Um, of him just giving a lecture, which I saw when I was over there for a week, a couple of years ago, where he's going, we're, we are going to stop the growth of the city, it's going to stop. And we're going to, you know, what we're going to do is going to be intensive instead. We're going to, you know, look at the kind of old housing projects we've, we've got and we're going to renovate them. We're going to look at the kind of, the, the, the kind of informal or semi-formal kind of industries that we have and we're going to kind of um, invest in those. Um, rather than this kind of endless, we will be a better global city and bigger and better and compete with all the others. And instead of kind of going, no, we're not going to play that game anymore. Um, and that was really interesting to me. <laughs>
Okay, the third is London needs to govern the rest of the country less and govern itself more. <laughs> well, I think that's true. That's self-explanatory, isn't it? Um, currently, you have a situation in London where you know it's it's extraordinarily difficult for something like landlord licensing, which features a lot in the last chapter of the book, to happen. And you know, actual kind of regulation of the rental sector is actually a thing where Westminster can decide whether or not you can do it. And um, Robert Jenrick can decide whether or not he approves Sadiq Khan's London plan. He can say, no, we're not going to accept it, which is actually what he did in March. Um, this seems to be completely bonkers. And at the same time, lots of the rest of the country has exactly the same questions. So, you know, whether or not a tram gets built in Leeds, whether or not a metro gets built in Manchester, um, these are decided in Westminster. And that strikes me similarly as, 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 as deeply unjust. Um, so really a kind of, you know, a kind of smash Westminster rebuild County Hall is the, the line of that. Mm. Maybe a time will come and we need to occupy County Hall. <laughs> <laughs> but so the fourth one is uh, maybe echoing that London's government needs to be unafraid of confrontation. Yeah, um, that is aimed directly at, at, at the current London mayor and his, his uh, staff, some of whom I think have the... You know, there's some kind of nice social democrats in there. There's some people that I think have have you know have nice ideas which they are, and have convictions which they deeply lack the courage of. And that's really just and and so it's very telling that Andy Burnham, who actually has a lot less powers than Sadiq Khan, was the one who said no to the government and the one who actually managed to have a kind of quite charismatic stand against the government. That's just not the kind of mayoralty that Khan has been running, although he has expanded its its its, its kind of remit in some ways. Um, and it's really a kind of like, you know, there is mass support in this city for, you know, I, I think a fairly radical left agenda, or at least a kind of um, agenda closer to the 80s than to the last 20 years. And, you know, go for it. You know, take people with you. Um, the one thing that I really like about the GLC in the 80s is that kind of interest in, and frankly, in propaganda and doing kind of festivals and events and, 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 you know, that kind of carnival-like atmosphere and the kind of throwing open of all of these public buildings and kind of, you know, building support with people going, you know, this is what we can do, this is what we are, this is what we can do for you. And the London mayor is really, really bad at that. And the kind of London mayoral system is really bad at that. So it's kind of trying to poke them a little bit in that direction and go, look, you are just not going to be ever, ever Robert Jenrick is never going to agree with you. So fight them. Good. Um, and the last, but just before we go into the last one, I'll just... Um, when Owen talked about propaganda, I, I, I loved, um, particularly, this is a bit narcissistic, but piece in his book where he described a pamphlet we did. This was a pamphlet we did on our, our jobs policy. Um, and it's just pure propaganda. I mean, it's very good propaganda, but it's, um, you know, we did it with Peter Kennard and, um, and it then, you know, was, was sold actually, or given, I think it was given out. Mm. And so, thousands and maybe even hundreds of thousands of Londoners got this little booklet which begins, it says, the wealth of London is the skill and sense of its people. This book is about unlocking that wealth. And then there's a Kennard image of unlocking London. Anyway, the final question which flows from that is, final, not a theme, thesis, is the London left needs to draw on its own past. Yeah, so that's really what the whole book is, I suppose, all about, is that there's this sort of, I think a lot of the rest of the left, particularly in the North, is very good at kind of like wielding its history and, you know, getting the union banners out and so on. And, and I'm kind of like, well, London has plenty of this. And London has, you know, the, the kind of London left has emerged out of far worse crises and with far less resources and done things. You know, there's a kind of impossibilism a lot of the time on the left, which which 1212 only, um, you know, kind of reinforced, of like, we can't do anything. And so it's a book of all th loads of things that were done, and it's supposed to be kind of like, to suggest, like, you know, looking at those 120 years is a good, you know, is a good sort of resource, in a way, for people that want to do things. So we can have nice things if we fight for them. That's, that's very much the point, yeah. The possibility of nice things. Thank you so much, Hilary and Owen. Um, 
Thank you both for all your wonderful books. Owen, thank you for this one so much. <laughs> You're very welcome. And, um, <laughs> sometime there'll be a, <laughs> hopefully there will be more postscripts. Um, Christina at Housemans, who is busy doing 12 things um, right at this very moment, uh, would want me to say thank you to everyone for coming. There's going to be a lot of great events coming up in the new year. And um, aha, message, thanks to Owen and Hillary. Um, so follow on the usual channels or come into the bookshop, buy some books. Thanks, thank everyone. you, Karen, for being a wonderful chair. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you to all who are here. <laughs> I'm looking forward to coming to Houseman's. <laughs> me too, me too. I, I, I have missed the basement greatly. <laughs> Mm. It still smells the same. <laughs> Glad to hear it. <laughs> so this is the point where we can't usher you slowly out all chatting, where we just Will hit it the red be open button. for Christmas shopping? <laughs> Will it be open for... Okay, good. Is that chin? Okay. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.